Greetings, comrades. Sanbonani, Molweni. Mine is, mine is just a short welcome. My name is Mwelela Tele. On behalf of the Forge, which is a space for the presentation and analysis of radical ideas coming from Pan African, socialist, feminist, and other progressive perspectives, and on behalf of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which is an international movement driven institution focused on stimulating intellectual debate that, serve, that serves people's aspirations. I, wake, I welcome you all, those who are watching online, those who will be watching in future, and those who are here with us at the Forge. I welcome you most warmly to the launch of Red Road to Freedom, a history of the South African Communist Party, 1921 to 2021, by Professor Tom Lodge. I would like to express appreciation to Professor Tom Lodge for accepting our invitation to come to launch his seminal work on the history of the party right here at the Forge, and for presenting a seminar organized by Pan Africa Today Secretariat at the Nkrumah Political School in Belabel. This seminar was attended by key comrades from our region, including representatives from the Socialist uh, Party of Zambia and the Socialist Platform of Zimbabwe. Comrades from Abatal Basem John Dolo and from Eswatin and Lesotho, to mention but a few. This week, Prof. Lodge is still going to deliver a presentation for Abatal Basem John Dolo movement in Deppen and for the NUMSA Political Education Forum. In addition, next week on Friday, the 5th of November, a New Frame podcast will be released by Radio New Frame, presenting a conversation between Professor Tom Lodge and Charles Leonard. I would also like to express much appreciation to our comrade, the Deputy General Secretary of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers' Party, Dr. Vashna Jagannath, the discussant for the launch of this book today. In many ways, Vashna's vision and, and encouragement in the, in the early planning stages for this launch have been very crucial. And I would like to express appreciation and many thanks to Jakana Press, the publishers of this important book, Red Road to Freedom. The facilitator, the facilitator today is Comrade Yonis, the director of Pen Africa Today, an organization committed to strengthening and unifying the anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist struggles of Africa's movements and, organization, and organizations through popular education, dialogue, and solidarity. He holds, he holds a master's degree in sociology and has done extensive research on popular politics in rural South Africa. I, I also want to thank uh, our other collaborators today, VAU FM, Voice of Vets, who are broadcasting this launch live as we speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Comrade Molela. Um, as you said, my name is Jonas. Um, I am very, very happy to be here today, not just because I'm among friends and comrades, but also because we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Professor Lodge, who has written really an ex excellent book. Um, I think we will have an opportunity not only to hear from him and our discussant, um, Dr. Vashna Jagannath, but also to have some questions and some issues raised from the floor and from our audience online. Because I think the hope for today is that we get an opportunity not just to grapple with what is seems to be a work of love that will have lasted many, many years to produce, but also to think about what does this mean in the conjuncture that we are in in South Africa, but even beyond. So today, the way we will take the session is to have a 25-minute speech or input by Professor Lodge, um, followed by about 15 minutes by Dr. Vashna Jagannath. Um, and from there, we will open up to questions and comments from the floor and have an opportunity to interact a little bit. Um, so it, it gives me a very great and warm pleasure to share a platform
with Professor Lodge. Um, we've had an opportunity to learn a lot from him, not only through his book, but also in some of the interactions that have been mentioned earlier. Um, he is currently a professor of peace and conflict studies at the University of Limerick, but is not unfamiliar with South Africa, as is not only testament from his book, but also he spent many years being a professor of political studies here in Johannesburg at the University of the Witwatersrand. So I, I think we will hand over to him to kick us off and then we will take it from there. Thank you very much. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. I, I think this is uh, not for um, the audience, but for the podcast, isn't it? So um, that's why I'm holding it up. Um, as you all know, or at least most of you probably know, uh, the Communist Party this year is celebrating its 100th birthday. Um, our purists might object and say that it isn't really its 100th birthday because there were two parties. There was a party that was folded up and prohibited in 1950, and then a party that was set up a couple of years later. But, but let's, let's leave such details aside. The party's having its birthday, and it's celebrating its century. Um, uh, publishers love it, if you can find an anniversary around which to hang a book title. And um, of course, uh, uh, the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party might seem to many other people uh, a, a good reason to write a book about the party. I think you need a better reason, though. I mean, just living to 100, of course, is an achievement for anybody. Um, and surviving the kinds of conditions that the party had to survive was in itself an achievement. But there are lots of things that are 100 and which won't get books written about them, quite rightly. Um, but my argument in the book that I have written, uh, and by the way, I started writing it in the 1980s before stopping because it was impossible to re research the party's history properly in the 1980s. But my argument in this book is, is, is that the party shaped South African history. And, and it was my major reason for wanting to write it, because I, I'm, in a, I'm, in a, I'm a South African-based, or I was a South African-based political scientist with actually a training in social history. Um, I, I graduated from a British university with a, very much a history background. And I, I'd already spent some time looking at the ANC, but very much looking at it, I wrote a book about it, informed by historical literature and some of the political science literature on social movements. And my understanding of the ANC was rather different from existing literature on the ANC because I, I, I represented the ANC as, as a movement that was in fact many movements, um, a, a movement of social movements, each movement very much determined and a product of a particular local setting. And so, so, so I was, uh, it was really you know, a, a very much a social historian's as opposed to a political scientist's approach to trying to understand a political organization. This was the ANC in the 1950s. And one of the things that I picked up was just how important the party was in helping to develop the networks along which the ANC constructed a mass organization in parts of South Africa in the 1950s. That's what I picked up in the research that I did for that book. And that knowledge helped prompt me to think, well, we need a book about the party that tries to explore its impact, its wider political impact, and the effects of its own development and story. Anyway, in the book, I make quite a few arguments about the ways in which the party shaped history. And let me just lay out some of them for you here. I mean, it's, 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 it's a desperate summary of, in fact, what are often quite complicated arguments in the course of a 630-page book uh, it's a very long book because, in fact, I have many stories to tell in it. But I, I hope what I'm going to say today might give you a sense of the overall argument and drift. How did the Communist Party shape South Africa 
historically? Well, first of all, they initiated political solidarities that cut across South Africa's racial and social cleavages through the early 20th century. And they began doing this from the party's formation in 1921 when they began recruiting black South Africans. And 10 years later, by 1931, there were black people leading the party and joining it in thousands. And leaving it almost as quickly, by the way, but that's another story. The party's commitment to cross-racial politics wavered now and then. Uh, and I provide plenty of evidence in the book of that wavering. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that through most of its history, it supplied real-world evidence, visible to its following and to other people as well, that black and white South Africans could share political goals and work towards them together. In the early 1930s, the first white communists were convicted and served prison sentences for sedition for trying to mobilize black South Africans. Today, in South Africa, communists can take a considerable portion of the credit for, well, I'm going to say this in a deliberately qualified way, for the extent to which the country's politics is non-racial. So that would be my first claim. That one is probably fairly familiar to most of you. Secondly, South Africa has one of the strongest labor movements in the developing world. Uh, a movement that, from time to time, can still shape or at least influence or at least restrict or confine government policy. Uh, the, the, the historical emergence of this movement is a complicated story. And communists didn't always predominate in it. They weren't the only labor pioneers. But in the 1930s and 1940s, people like the recently disembarked Latvian immigrant, Ray Alexander, getting off the boat in Cape Town, she got off the boat, found, in fact, somebody who was a policeman, and asked him where the Communist Party office was, marched in and said she was going to organize trade unions. And she was as good as her word. She did. Uh, for the next 50 years or so. Anyway, Ray Alexander assembled industrial unions that would con constitute enduring foundations for what was to follow. Uh, some of today's most powerful trade unions can trace their genealogy back to her efforts, even if the memories of their members don't necessarily recollect the kind of history that one could track through their stories. Communists in the 1940s, such as the Port Elizabeth dry cleaning worker, Raymond Plubber, another trade unionist, worked out a strategy of alliances, beginning with community protests to support strike movements. And this coalition of labor leaders and community activists would persist through the next five decades, helping to enable national liberation in 1994. In fact, at a local level in the 1940s, and I do think the 40s was in many ways a decisive decade for South Africa, at a local level, trade unionists often were community leaders, as well as belonging to the Communist Party, oh, as well as sitting on advisory boards, as well as leading ANC branches, though the ANC barely existed at a branch level in the 1940s. In other words, they wore lots of different hats at the same time. And this actually made Port Elizabeth rather unusual, because elsewhere, many of the existing political networks which engaged black South Africans were not led, even at a local level, by people who you could call workers. New Brighton and Port Elizabeth was very different 
different because of the comparative absence of an elite, even the modest kind of elite that existed in many South African centers, but an elite that made itself culturally, as it were, influential, and the powerful presence of working class leadership. Now, following the party's prohibition, these leaders and their active communist followings, oh, by the way, you could make much the same argument about Lunga outside Cape Town. They continued to organize and mobilize. And it was no coincidence that where the ANC had the most entrenched and systematic presences in the 1950s were in the localities in which communists were best organized in the 1940s. In short, the decade of defiance was incubated in party networks. Now, there are plenty of other ways in which the party stamped its historical imprint. If the armed struggle was decisive, and it was certainly important in inspiring other kinds of political action during the 1980s, then communists supplied many of the key members of its general staff and field commands, the ideas, the sense of moral certainty, the vision that held that struggle together. From the 1920s, a different example. Onwards, through its night schools and other training facilities, the party educated successive echelons of South African political leadership. Nelson Mandela's first acquaintance with formal political organization was in his attendance while serving as an article clerk at the, Michael, at, 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 at the night school that the party ran in Fox Street. That's where he made friends. This was in 1944 with Michael Harmel, by then the party's most important thinker. He didn't join the party till later, but that's another story. That the ANC today, in its internal discourses, still uses the jargon and phraseology employed by the party's commissars in the Angolan training camps 40 years ago is testimony to their, to their enduring effectiveness as educators. Oh, and education was terribly important for the party. If you're a communist, you read books. When When, 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 when one of the uh, original party leaders arrived in South Africa from Britain, a man who was going to become a leader in the engineering union and also a representative in parliament of white labor, he brought a, a change of clothes in his trunk and a bookcase full of books. He had grown up in the countryside, the son of farm workers. The only schools he attended were until the age of 12. If you were a communist, you read books. Earlier than any other South African political movement, the Communist Party brought women into leadership. And the pioneers whom the party should be recalling, and indeed is recalling on its birthday, include key women. Rebecca Bunting, Josie Palmer, Molly Walton, Dora Tamana, Betty Dutoy, Ruth First. Is it just history, though, that the party will be celebrating? What about today? Communists have held important positions in ANC governments for nearly 30 years. Today, they can count their membership in hundreds of thousands, not just hundreds. But are they still shaping, his, shaping history? South African communists argue that their participation in government makes a real difference. They say that they reinforce the government's commitment to socially progressive policies, to public employment programs, to reindustrialization, to better foreign trade policies, to, to, to more help for students, that kind of thing. Though they also can see that much of their effort is undone by political corruption and bureaucratic inefficiency, and they fail to shift 
This is what they say. The government's neoliberal macroeconomic policy is significantly. And they openly admit that increasingly they've been marginalized. They are present in government. They are appointed to ministerial positions and so on. Uh, there's a respectable number of ANC MPs who are members of the party. A diminishing number, but a respectable number. But they're on the whole doing important jobs, but not the key jobs in government, not the ones which are really about the most key decisions that determine broad macroeconomic policy, for example. They also suggest that they play a role in limiting public finality amongst office holders. Now, that might be true. Though initially they helped defend President Zuma against his critics, as well as contributing to his victory at Polo Kwani. <coughs> Though I suspect he would have won without them. <coughs> Does their membership really matter? The party's following, the 300,000 or so people who belong to the party, they don't constitute a disciplined electoral bloc within the ANC's own internal voting procedures. I mean, the Communist Party might decide in a couple of years' time that, it will, that its delegates will support Cyril Ramaphosa or somebody else. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every Communist Party delegate is going to heed the party's advice. They didn't at previous ANC internal election meetings. It's not a membership of that, as I say, that acts as a coherent, uni unified pressure group within the ANC. Nor is it a membership that draws solidarity from its participation in manufacturing in the classic Marxian sense. Indeed, the largest social group, or at least one of the very large social groups from whom the party most rapidly recruits is young unemployed people, a group that keeps following. The party's present strategic purpose is about building capacity for socialism. In following this course, it's fair to say that its present challenges are as formidable as anything it has confronted in the past. In the past, arguably, South Africa's developmental trajectory as a rapidly industrializing developing country. In the past, South Africa's history was on the party's side. Things are very different today. Thank you very much, Professor Lodge. Um, I think the task for the three of us is to convey to everyone here and at home um, that this is absolutely a book worth reading, a book worth engaging. Um, for those of you already convinced, like me, um, the book is for sale at the back, um, as well as across the road at the Commune Bookshop. But for those of you who need a little more of a nudge, um, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Vashna Jagannath. Um, she is also a historian and a teacher and a scholar in her own right, um, but has also spent a lot of time in recent, year, recent years building organizations that strengthen the working class. Um, so she's the Deputy General Secretary of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party, but also has been doing the work alongside where I work in Pan-Africa today um, and working, heading up an organization called the Friends of the Workers. So I'll hand over to her for 15 minutes um, and then we will open up after that. Comrade Vashna, over to you. Great. Uh, do I have to stand? <laughs> cool. Um, it wouldn't make a difference. I'm not very tall. So <laughs> it's fine. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Lodge for this amazing book. It's been an incredible pleasure to read, as you can tell. I've read it in detail. Uh, I was quite stressed by the task because there's so much. It's such a rich book. And I think 
one of the things I was struggling with was how to respond, what angle to take in terms of this text for today. But um, I think for me there's some themes that really spoke out to me uh, that I would like to highlight here now uh, that give also different angles to the book because there's so much, it's such a good historical text because not only does it have the sort of narrative, it also has the deep, rich history, the actual material of history within the book. I mean, the footnotes are amazing. It's a fantastic thing for historians, uh, footnotes and those sources, and I want to thank you for making that so detailed. That's really also an amazing thing about the book is that it offers material that can be further investigated upon. For me, I think, um, some of the main things, I mean, um, Professor Lodge spoke to the fact that, yes, it's important to commemorate an anniversary, uh, but I think also much more importantly is that this book provides a sort of history of the SACP that has not largely been written up until now. It really is an area that has been lacking in work. What we have seen a lot of is a sort of covering of certain periods of history of the SACP, but not something that does the entire 100 years. We've also had lots of biographies of individuals who are in the SACP who talk about their time within that. And this book actually does an excellent job in capturing a lot of those narratives. And interestingly for me in those narratives is the sort of psychological stories as well around struggle, around being an activist. Um, the stories around uh, Professor Raymond Sattner is very moving about him preparing himself to go and become an activist, to go and do certain sorts of work and understanding what that's going to be and the damage that it might do to him and training for it and training his mind for it. So I thought that was captured incredibly well in the book. For me, the best parts of the book, being a historian obviously, was the late 19th, early 20th century history of this period in South Africa and this part of the world which really, like the best books in South African history, give a very cosmopolitan view of uh, Southern Africa. It provides you with the sort of heavy debates that were happening at the time. I think one of the key things that comes out of this is um, the sort of ways in which communism and socialism was not a static thing in its embryonic state in, South in Southern Africa. There was huge debates amongst various strains, various schools that Professor Lodge captures very well here. The syndicalism, the sort of schools from the United States, the influence of the United States, the influence of Great Britain, the influence of Russia, and also the influence of Australia and workers coming in from there, which gave a different tinge to each strain of socialism. And also what you can see is when Professor Lodge spoke now, he said that the racism, you know, they were actively against organizing cross-racial lines, but there were moments when that was not happening. And you see how that comes in from particular parts of the world, uh, these strains, which, are, which is really well done here. And I think for me also, the other really important bit about this internationalist question is the way in which Russia comes to play a very important role uh, in the sort of communist movement in South Africa. And what I found interesting is uh, when people are saying this is just like Russia and trying to think about South Africa and the context in Southern Africa, it reminded me of the ways in which other communist experiments across the continent later on, whether it's in Kruma and Nerera and so on, tried to think through a class politics with their own experiences, in the way that Lenin does in Russia itself. But people tend to just take that template and impose it. So there was that, that, that attempt to do that very early on, which was really, really useful. And for me, as also very much involved in the pan-African world, thinking that tied the story of communism much more to the continent than we've thought about before. Because we often have the South African exceptionalism story. And I think that reading of it really illuminates that. So that was uh, very important. But also the tension between the international and the local. That's very importantly drawn out, the different struggles, the different debates that people are ha having. And these are very importantly, and I think this is the other thing that this early chapters do, and much all, I think the chapters all the way through, how do you build an organization? How do you embed it within struggles? How do you think through this? 
keeping it all the time in articulation to the international, trying to bring those two into conversation with each other, making it relevant for both groups. That really is um, something that's so important. And, you know, um, what this book also does, like various other texts that we have from South Africa, whether you're thinking about the work of someone like Lucien van der Waalt, or whether you're thinking even about the work like someone like Charles van Onselen, is it showing you that from the very beginning and the formation of capital in South Africa, there is resistance to capital. And I love those stories the most, the ones that show us that people are resisting exploitation and oppression, because we've come to think of capital as just the system. We've come to think of labor and work and the discipline of the workday as normal. You know, we just all the time encouraging people to go to work and be contributing to society and all of that. But the ways in which people were continuously resisting it, and this fits into that wonderful trajectory of historical work by people like Peter Leinbauer, and also work by actual people who are talking about their lives, biographies of women like Sojourner Truth, an ex-slave, that show you that people are continuously resisting exploitation, they're continuously resisting oppression. It's not the natural state of being. And I think this really demonstrates that, and people were doing it for over 100 years. Um, there's also, I think, some other really important points that we need to capture around the theme that comes in much later with the development of the party and then the coming into leadership of African leaders. And that theme, I think, is, I mean, all of these themes are still relevant today to us, but this theme about mentoring, about making sure that the African leaders know what they're saying, how they're saying it, and so on, was also something that does come up. Uh, Katani, when he's writing, has this line where he says, I was the editor of the paper, but the paper would be published and I wouldn't even see it. And, you know, that speaks to the, 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 the lot of, a lot of the ways in which movements today still feel that control. They still feel that if you're working class, if you are outside of the intellectual sphere, that you are not taken seriously. That there has to be someone who articulates your ideas to the world. And that was very well captured in that aspect of the story. And, um, you know, I've just got so much of notes here, sorry, and in the book as well. So I'm just going through things in a fairly haphazard way, but I'm hoping it makes some sense um, to, to people. And I really do think that when I started reading the book, I was so happy because communism has taken such a beating uh, in, in, in our recent past. I was so happy that this sort of narrative and this history gets told in showing the deep commitment of so many communists towards non-anti-racist non politics and towards agenda politics that was seeking, even though it wasn't always achieving it, seeking to include women. And uh, I, I have to say that, yes, they did include women, but the ways in which women's narratives still get written out in dominant narratives about communism is something we have to take very seriously and we have to think about. Uh, for example, um, Professor Lodge, I was very interested in um, Mary Fitzgerald. Uh, she seems fantastic, but also various other women. I mean, we know the story of Ruth first, but I think this speaks to a larger issue with the archive and what materials we have and the nature of how archives itself are masculine. The way in which information is gathered together is masculine because it usually seeks to look at who's in leadership, who is running the thing, and often it was men. And the work that gets done to get the man onto the stage or to get them to lead is often done by women, but their narratives, their lives is left out of those stories. And so even when you are looking for it in an archive, it's very difficult to find. It's, there's a silence there. If we think about Nadezhda Krupskaya, for example, it took such a long time for people to begin to talk about her and her role in Iskra, in the communist movement, in the education projects, and also the vitally fundamental role she played in Lenin's life. So I think that that is something I would like you to perhaps expand on and, and, and speak to a bit more here uh, today. The other thing I would like, um, I think, and I will stop then, is to, for us to think about perhaps um, in the 1970s and 80s, I mean, in the early part of the communist history, there's a lot of direct contact with the United States, the UK, 
and Russia and parts of Eastern Europe. But obviously after the sort of destruction of the communist movement in America largely, uh, there, there seems to be not that reconnection that happens because you do have in the 70s and 80s the rise of a lot of socialist uh, movements and programs coming up from especially African Americans in the United States and I'm thinking about also the work of someone like Angela Davis and what sort of impact would that have had on the communist movement here? What was the engagement? I know um, Ronnie Castles did have encounters with someone like Malcolm X, which he's spoken about. But thinking about where was the reading of those texts that could have really brought a, into the Communist Party a sort of much more, a politics embedded much more within race, class, and gender together, which often is a criticism. And it seems missing from them. And I was just thinking through that, if you could perhaps also speak to that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, that was a very, very generous um, and well-organized um, uh, summary of, 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 of what I've tried to do in the book. And I, I actually think she did a lot better job than I did. Um, <laughs> Professor, well done. Um, I think you're right. I, I mean, w women are underwritten in my history. Um, they're more generally underwritten. I haven't done a, a, a sort of gendered head count, but I think the 60 or so biographies or autobiographies of individual communists, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a disproportionately male output. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that women constitute and have constituted at times um, approximately half the party's membership. Um, I mean, there are powerful and important women in the party, and there have been in its past, and they're well known. Uh, but there's been relatively little attempt to systematically capture their lives and make generalizations about them. Uh, Josie and Palmer has had a wonderful biography written about her by Bob Edgar. And um, Ray Alexander has less left her own um, very evocative and, and, and haunting memoir. Um, but. Uh, it's fairly exceptional. Um, oddly enough, um, I'm going to go a bit out on a limb, but we, we don't actually have a really good study of Ruth First. Um, I mean, she's so frequently referred to, and she has become, partly because she was in some ways intellectually distanced from the party's theoretical center. In some ways, she's become a, an iconic figure with a, a sort of wider appeal than most of these party personalities have in the other left movements outside the Communist Party. That me really brings me to uh, the second question. Uh, well, sorry, I need, but, but just returning to the first one, though, um, I, I think that writing out is, it, it's, 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 it's true that the party brought women into leadership and organization to a greater extent than other parties were doing in, 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 at the time, you know, before 1950 and even afterwards, arguably. But, um, there was a division of labor which reflected the wider kinds of divisions of labor that existed socially. Uh, women were very rarely elected or put into leadership positions. Um, it was also the case that um, uh, at a sort of local community level where the party functioned as a community, there was a you know, fairly pat patrimonial or patriarchal relationship between uh, uh, black, I'm sorry, um, uh, male communists and female communists, uh, whether one's talking about black communities or white communities. Um, on external linkages and the United States, um, the connections of the American Party were quite weak um, um, up until the exile period because, um, on the whole, when the party made contact with the wider common communist world, either through Comintern or later on, more generally. Um, it did so through the United Kingdom Communist Party, the Communist Party of Great Britain. And, and indeed, the Communist Party of Great Britain had a colonial committee, um, which, which included you know, South Africa as one of its assignments. And the British Party, from time to time, would provide advice uh, and send people out to South Africa. 
uh, it, 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 it didn't have the same strong connections with the United States, though individual American communists did play quite an important role at a certain stage as Comintern visiting officials and inspectors uh, in the 1930s. Um, American communist broderism had some local support uh, during the Second World War. Broderism was essentially a kind of communist reform movement. I could say more about it, but it's fairly specialized. Um, but, you know, the connections with the American Communist Party, I don't think brought any of the kind of excitement that you've suggested they might have done. Uh, yes, it's true that Angela Davis, you know, sometimes appears at sort of functions and there are encounters like that. But on the whole, the connections with the Com American Communist Party were fairly perfunctory and the Co American Communist Party itself wasn't um, in, in the 1970s and 80s going through a particularly exciting period of its history, to put it mildly. Uh, and Angela Davis was not central to the party. I mean, she was a much more important personality and figure in her own right than any other American communist was at that time. Um, so, um, in the case of the American Communist Party, the, the links were not very important. More generally, in the exile period, the party tended to work through other communist parties, and so it didn't have and didn't try to foster connections with the kind of new left movement that was emerging uh, on, on the sort of left bank in Paris or, or in the British universities or elsewhere in Europe. Um, of course, I mean, party intellectuals were aware of such currents, but the party's, as it were, official life, its organized political life, was conducted through the prism of fraternal relations. And that meant fraternal relationships with, you know, fairly orthodox communist parties that themselves were not interested in, in the kinds of ideas, in the sort of arguments about the trajectory of socialism that were at the center of the New Left project. Um, and the party also took its Eastern European allies, understandably, very seriously. It was much more influenced, I think, theoretically, by um, the experiences of Eastern Europe uh, than it was by the changes that were occurring on British or French university campuses, for example, in the 1960s. I think that, oh, um, on Moses Kotani, um, you mentioned him. Um, Kotani is an absolutely compelling and fascinating figure in this story. And um, again, it's, there is a biography of him. It's not a very exciting one. It makes him out to be much duller than he really was. Um, Shame, it was written by Brian Bunting uh, as an act of solidarity and I'm sure an act of love. But um, Katani was actually brave, clever, acerbic, witty, and intensely loyal to his friends um, and harsh on his enemies. And he predominated in the party's organizational life, not so much as intellectual life, from the 1930s through to the late 1960s. He, he died in a hospital in Moscow uh, after a fairly long period as a convalescent. Uh, but, but he's a terribly important person. He also um, was very difficult to frighten. Um, uh, he, he, he was threatened when he was in Moscow um, at one of these Comintern Commission investigations into the Communist Party. Uh, and he, he, he was asked about his Trotskyite mate, Eddie Rue, uh, and what was this stuff about Eddie Rue being a Trotskyite, and that kind of stuff. And Moses said, but Eddie Rue is a friend of mine. He's not a Trotskyite. He does have his own mind about certain things, but they're things about which he knows more than me. I'm not going to make judgments. Eddie Rue was a prominent and conspicuous critic of Lyshenko, uh, the Soviet agricultural expert. Uh, Rue's professional life, his academic life, um, he was a botanist. So Katani is, 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 is an immensely engaging and interesting and attractive figure. And if anyone's looking for a biography to write, Katani's your man. And there's a very good paper trail as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'll also stand up now because it's time for me to see all the hands that are going to go up for questions, comments, um, I think both our speakers have demonstrated to us um, that
this is a very important conversation for us to have um, for a range of reasons. I won't go through the cliches of the need to understand history, to understand our future, but I think the, the two points that Professor Lodge kind of pivoted his discussion or his input on around the point that the South African Communist Party did play an important role in South Africa's history. And I think the question is still open of the role that it continues to play and the extent to which it continues to make history. So I think it raises a series of questions. If Marx said that, that philosophers have interpreted the world and we must change it, then I think people who have changed the world are worth studying and worth engaging. And I think also worth learning from. So on that note, I want to invite in particular for now our online viewers to share with us any questions or comments or contributions so that we can make sure that they get to the panel, um, but also open up to the floor that we have here today to ask if there are any questions, comments, contributions so that we can enrich the discussion that has so beautifully been started by our two panelists. So I'm standing to see hands. I note one, maybe we can take a round of questions. So one, two, is there a third one or we should start with these two and come back for another round? So I think we can start, ah, okay, I see a third one and then we'll start with Musa on round two. Um, do we have a roaming mic or I'll pass mine on? Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Bandile, and I'll continue this trend of standing. Um, uh, my question comes because, uh, firstly, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lodge and uh, Dr. Jagannath, for your, for your presentations. Um, uh, I've come to this uh, book launch precisely because uh, I don't have a deep enough knowledge at all about the SACP. I kind of know them, uh, given the space that I work in. I know them uh, for their history and that they're part of the Tripart Alliance, and you know, kind of, they are famous figures in South African civil society and economics um, who are part of it. But I, I don't have any insight insights um, into into the character of the of the party. So, my question. Um, is the question that was uh, 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 hinted to by Yolis. Um, if you had to argue to a lay person why understanding the, you know, the party, the current role of the party into the future is relevant. Um, someone who's unconvinced, someone who doesn't have skin in the game, uh, uh, and in particular I'd like to know how the book uh, bears on to kind of uh, what the current status of the, 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 the Communist Party is. Um, and in particular, this is the more theoretical part, um, in what ways the telling of the history directly affects, kind of equips us for the, for the future. Because sometimes history is nice. Um, the history of the Peloponnesian War or whatever is interesting. But it's only useful if there are tight links between like in illuminating what exists today uh, uh, and how well we can predict the future. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, second question, um, Mulela, will you be? I, I think for the online viewers, they won't hear you without the microphone. I've got a substantial voice. <coughs> okay. So first of all, the details, r really great to have sort of scholarship is quite outstanding. Often people have argued, especially on the left, about concepts without any kind of detail. I haven't gone far into the book. I've probably read a quarter of it. The thing I found very disappointing about the first section that I've read is how you talk about a party without talking about the class. So you don't contextualize what you say at all. And I found myself completely lost in trying to understand the size of the working class, say, for instance, before 1921, in its different factions, who's doing what, how big the class is, where the Communist Party tries to seat itself within that relationship, who's who. It's all dealt with as if everything's equal, and I, I, I got lost. I didn't understand at all from what I read that most infamous of 
positions of the Communist Party in supporting the white workers, when palpably it was a completely reactionary thing to do. White workers fighting to preserve their own privilege and the Communist Party sort of standing back from that. I want to now go after the Second World War. After the Second World War, the debate that I'm familiar with, which justifies the Communist Party position, and I'm not familiar with this now from what you've read, because I haven't got there yet, but it was an argument that there was a two-stage theory in South Africa of revolution because there was a huge peasantry after the Second World War. And to the best of my knowledge, that's just simply not true. It was argued up into the 1970s. I remember having discussions with David Lewis about this. A, a, a huge urban peasantry. There was no huge urban peasantry. There were working class people who were unemployed and their families who were living in rural areas. That didn't turn them into peasants. But the real thing is, what about today? So you've now spoken about the way in which the Communist Party is in government, etc., etc. But where is the Communist Party putting forward a position in support of the working class? Because you could argue for two-stage theories or whatever you like in the past, but what about now? Well, we palpably don't have that. Where is a political position that argues for the independent interests of the working class? Where do we ever hear that? Certainly, I don't hear it. Here we have a local election, so I don't hear it. I don't hear it at all. Perhaps you might r relate that, and, and maybe it has got quite a lot to do with the past and the history leading up to where we are, that we don't seem to have an independent position today. Thank you. I, I think we can take one more and then allow Prof to respond. Okay. I, I don't have a powerful voice, so I'm going to need the mic. Um, so I, w I was looking through your book earlier, and I, I was kind of trying to imagine the daunting task of writing something of this scope. And I was thinking that there are two sort of different and partly divergent ways in which you can write a book like this. And the one is to focus on um, the sort of prominent and powerful voices, um, the leaders, the people whose names we know and who resonate with us. And then you can write a history of the people who packed away the chairs after the annual conferences and the people who loaded the printing presses to print the propaganda and a kind of people's history. And I was just wondering if that was something that you had to grapple with when you were undertaking this task, from what direction do you approach it, especially given the sort of communist ethos. Um, and then a second really, really short question is just outside of the Communist Party, when you look at the sort of broad left terrain today in South Africa, what makes you hopeful? Great. Thank you. We can hand over to Prof. Um, terrific questions. Thank you very much. And, 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 and good criticism. In many cases, fully accept. Um, is the party still relevant to the future of South Africa? In other words, is the party still making history, if you like? Um, I think the politest and gentlest way to put it would be to a much less important extent than would have been the case 50 years ago. Um, it, it might have that potential to do so in the future, but um, I think even party leaders would concede that the extent to which the party can shape top echelon ANC leadership is lessening. And um, whereas the party may have affected the ANC in ways that are still evident, I don't think its, it's history, as long as it remains a, a movement encased within a larger organization, is going to be historically decisive in the way that it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, uh, and of course, there are people in the party themselves who, who would suggest that it's time for the party to make a break and contest elections separately and so on. But that's another story. Um, are there lessons, because I think that was the second question that Pandila was asking, that are of practical utility about this history? Um, I would argue that there are. Um, uh, I'll just take um, one, um, no, two. Um, the first one that's important is that 
in the party's history is that at times it could be extraordinarily effective functioning with very small numbers. Um, you don't need a mass party necessarily to be politically effective. At no stage in the party's history until 1990 did it have more than, let's say, hypothetically, a membership of eight or 9,000. And often it counted its members in hundreds, not thousands. I think that's a useful lesson for all of us to remember today. The second important lesson is quite an unusual one. Um, a particularly crucial constituency that at one stage or another would provide the party with leadership, well not a constituency, but a particularly important social group that would provide the party with leadership at certain stages and with recruitment and which would be enabling the party to act in quite decisive ways at certain stages were university students. The party itself never set out deliberately to recruit such people, nor did it always recognize their existence as a group within the party. But they were important, and I think more generally speaking, that's a lesson that we can take out of this history that's important for understanding modern South African politics. Organizations that neglect to shape and influence university students, after all in this country today, make up approximately what's about 10%, 12% of those who are currently in education are being very short-sighted. Oh, well, there was more on class from the bracing set of criticisms. Um, and um, I, I, I tried to provide as much contextual information as I felt was necessary. But I'd be the first to agree that if you're looking for a history of the African working class, uh, then, then, then you need to read something different from my book. Um, you need to read, for example, Phil Bonner's magnificent contribution to the Cambridge modern history. Um, I, I don't set out to do that. I, and, and perhaps at certain stages I might have provided more conceptual information than I did. Um, the, 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 the business of whether or whether or not uh, the 1922 mine workers' strike was palpably reactionary is, of course, a, a, an issue which has uh, predominated in the historiography on the 1922 strike. Um, Jeremy Crickler's book is, I think, um, a, a hallmark study, and, and, and uh, um, you should read it if you haven't. Um, I, I have difficulties. I mean, yes, my, white mine workers were, in a certain sense, privileged in contrast to black mine workers. Uh, they were hardly a labor aristocracy, and they did not lead easy lives. Most white mine workers that participated in the 1922 rebellion were already dying. They were dying of phthisis, which is an agonizing disease. Bramfontein, the cemetery, used to keep 10 open graves. They were for the white mine workers who would arrive every year, every, every day, sorry, every week from the mines. Uh, they didn't, of course, have 100 graves for the corresponding number of African mine workers. So in that sense, my, white mine workers were privileged. But they did dirty, dangerous, and difficult work. And they were paid better than black mine workers, but they were paid miserably. Um, I'm not going to go into the arguments in the book about the extent to which the white mine workers were racist. Of course they were. Uh, the extent to which the 1922 strike was or was not a struggle against capital. It was, by the way, and Lenin thought so too. Um, but read the book and disagree with me, and that's fine. Um, Two-stage revolution. The, there are lots of different versions of the notion of a two-stage revolution that operated and functioned in different communist parties throughout the world. On the whole, South Africans, when they talked about their two-stage revolution, didn't justify the idea of moving through nationalism first and reaching socialism later, national liberation and then socialism, with reference to a large peasantry. Uh, they rather, in fact, over-accentuated the extent to which um, South Africa was industrialized. Um, there were quite interesting debates, you're absolutely right though, conducted by some South African communists, but not so much within the party, 
about whether or whether or not migrant workers in factories had a worker consciousness or a peasant consciousness. And it may be that uh, that, that, that prompted your question. Um, on, on, on the Communist Party today, um, uh, I, look, I mean, um, it, it's, 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 if, if a Communist Party is so folded into government that it can no longer, or for one reason or another, chooses no longer to be engaged in massive militant popular struggles, uh, then it's, it's denying itself certain critical opportunities. Um, I, I think the question, the methodological question about writing a party through the memoirs, the voices, the lives of its notables, as opposed to the bottle washers and the people who stack up the chairs after meetings, is actually a very, very good one. And um, I, I think um, underlying the question is an important methodological critique of my book, is that um, I don't spend enough time, I think, or invest enough effort in trying to explore the um, varieties of experience that communist membership involved and um, the differences in perspectives from people who were, if you like, ordinary day-to-day -day members and people who were leaders. Um, I think it's less important as the story gets nearer to the present because between 1950 and, 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 and 1990 that the party becomes extremely small and there are no bottle washers or chair folders. Everyone is doing something absolutely critical. But it is an important point um, about the earlier period. Um, today, of course, it's interesting as well. Um, I, and I, I, what that last chapter in our book, uh, which I think personally is the weakest chapter, uh, I, I know it's not normal at book launches for, 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 for writers to, to, to join in with their critics, but um, if I was to rewrite it, I'd do some ethnographic work interviewing young communists in small Natal rural communities and ask them what it means to them to be a member of the Communist Party. And that kind of perspective, the perspective of the rank and file membership is missing from my text. Great, thank you very much. Um, I promised the second round. I want to kick it off with a question from one of our online viewers, which is, are there communists in the SACP today? That's your first question, <laughs> not mine, but from a viewer. Um, and then I think the next hand up was Musa, and then can we just see another round? Um, so one, two, is there a third one? Three, okay. You will pass the mic to one another. I, I think the, the online viewer read my mind. I too wanted to ask uh, Prof whether, you know, well, I have two questions. Let me start with the first one. Um, you mentioned now ethnography that you would have loved to do interviews. I wanted to ask whether there was a story that was shared by Vashna about uh, Professor Raymond Sattner. Whether did you do some interviews with, with, with characters like that, or you confined yourself to the archive and, 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 and stuff like that. And secondly, people my age you know, know of the SACP of Platon's Monday. And the unfortunate part is that in, in, in the name of the party, there is communist. So people imagine communism or think of SACP as the custodian of communism in this country. Then I ask in context of the, of the viewer, is there communism? Is it time for us to think differently of the party, not erase its history, but to think differently of the party today, not as a party that represents or stands for anything that is associated with communism. Okay, uh, can I actually answer these questions because they cluster rather nicely, All right. and then we'll go to some more. Um, I mean, I in many ways, people are asking the same question, is, is the modern party justifiably a communist party? Um, if it depends what you mean, I think is the short answer. I'm not trying to cheat or wiggle out of it. 
But if by a communist you mean somebody who is actively involved in the independent organization of the working class as a class um, through a militant set of struggles that ultimately is meant to achieve a change in the predominant mode of production. Um, well, communists at the level of leadership in the South African Communist Party at this stage aren't engaged in doing that. But I don't think that's the only definition of a communist. I think they believe that they are communists. Uh, they've been trained as communists. They believe in the merits of ultimately um, the kinds of societies, the kinds of um, uh, uh, models of economic organization that for a while existed in certain parts of Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Um, that may not necessarily be your idea of what a communist should be, but they think they are communists. They're not, as they are often re rejected by their critics, as simply cynical careerists. You know, honestly, if you want to get on in the ANC, there are a lot of easier ways of doing it than joining the Communist Party. That might have been the case in the 80s and the 70s when the ANC was underground. Though the people that joined the Communist Party inside South Africa were incredibly brave. People like your comrade Raymond Sutner, for example, who, who is one of the bravest and, and finest men I know. Um, so, it depends what you mean by communist. Uh, I, broadly speaking, think there are people leading the party who believe they are communists. Um, on the very interesting methodological question um, about archives and so forth, um, I do use a lot of interviews. I, some of them I've conducted myself. Uh, I was actually able, for example, to interview Douglas Walton, the man who was Common turns emissary to South Africa and the party's general secretary in 1930 um, before he died. And that was one of the things I did manage to do in the 1980s. Um, I did quite a lot of it. By the way, it was a hopeless interview. He didn't tell me anything interesting, but he gave me some fabulous photographs. Uh, and the photographs were much more interesting, actually, than anything that he told me. Um, anyway, I did, yes, quite a lot of interviewing, but I also used uh, increasingly as it's possible to do, other people's interviews and their transcripts that are, exist in various university collections of historical papers. Um, and uh, the Witz collection and the Cape Town collections are particularly strong in that regard. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful member, I think she is still a member of the Communist Party, called Sylvia Neem, who um, for a long time lived in uh, East Germany, uh, in the German Democratic Republic as it was called then. And she's written a, uh, an extraordinary book, um, a three-volume book about the ICU, which was published by UNISA some years back. Um, it, it's a tough read, but a very rewarding one. Um, she, she, the, the work is a recent piece of scholarship, though very much shaped, I would argue, by the kind of training that she had in her development, first of all at Witz as a university student, and later at the University of Leipzig in East Germany, as well as being in London for a while. Anyway. Uh, the point about Sylvia, though, is that she started doing the research for a book about the ICU uh, in the 60s, because that's when she did her MA thesis at, at Fitz. And, I mean, she was doing the stuff, interviewing surviving members of ICU networks, when most people, even professors, weren't leaving their campuses. Um, I mean, she really is a pioneering scholar uh, and researcher of South African social history. Um, and it's wonderful that her work is now being published. Um, but anyway, I do quite use quite a lot of um, uh, interview material in my book, but I do use archival material as well. And uh, um, I mean, I, I don't privilege one source or another, but uh, archival sourcing um, ha has a particular advantage over interviews because you're not dependent on memory. Uh, and archives usually uh, I mean, they often have silences in them. They often may rep misrepresent things in particular ways. Um, but they report things, they detail things as they are happening at the time, usually, rather than imposing a retrospective judgment on what's important and what isn't, which is rather what happens when you conduct an interview. I use both, but I do think with interviews it's very important to use them very carefully. And uh, it's always nice if you have several people talking about the same thing. Uh, it's often different.
each, each narrative, and those differences are important. It's not that one person is misrepresenting anything, it's just that at the time, people may have had different understandings of what, went, what was going on, and those different understandings helped to shape what was going on. I think there are more questions. Yes, yes, yes there were two more, I think. Uh, Did I answer? Oh, no, you're going to ask. Yes, yeah, that's good. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So at the beginning of your talk, um, there was a passing comment you made concerning race to say that, you know, the Communist Party was very instrumental in terms of fostering the whole idea around non-racialism that we embraced as, as a country. Uh, and uh, I, so I, I need you to, first of all, confirm that um, did I understand you to be saying that in a positive no. manner? No, it's, it's, it's a very important point. I, the Communist Party in practice, uh, white people, black people, and so forth, work together collaboratively. So it could be, make stronger tr um, claims in that sense mm -hmm. for representing, if you like, a non-racist tradition okay. in South African politics. But as an idea, um, as, as, uh, communist uh, non-racism didn't really catch on in the communist movement. Uh, in other words, communists didn't reject the idea of race per se, if that's what you mean by non-racism as an idea. Is that what you mean? Um, okay, in so other words, for example, they didn't do the kind of critique of race that was being undertone by pe undertaken by people like Benny Keese, for example, in the New Era Fellowship, the, the people grouped in different formations and organizations left of the party in Cape Town in the 1940s. They weren't doing that kind of work. Oh, okay. Um, okay, uh, perhaps then uh, I should then get to the other part. It, it, it actually changes the, the question, but the substance I think remains the same. Um, it, it, it's, it's a, my, my, my question is about the intersection of race and class and how the Communist Party throughout its history has understood itself. And the reason I'm asking this question is specifically because of you know critiques that have been coming up since the early 2000s from uh, people like uh, uh, Frank Wilderson, right, who argues that you know one of the key deficiencies of uh, a Marxist framework is that it fails to capture the existential categories that. Um, define the black experience. And this is something that he particularly, a, a, a critique that he delineates in his, uh, in, in, in his, argu in his argument in uh, um, Gramsci's Black Marx. So um, my question to you is, uh, to what extent did you, do you understand the work that the Communist Party to be doing to actually have been really responding to the native question, as it, as, as, it, as it was called back in those days, but also, um, I think, more fundamentally to the question of anti-blackness uh, as, as an overwhelming reality. And then the second question is, uh, what are your thoughts about you know, the concept of spontaneity as Rosa Luxemburg uh, articulates it in terms of how it played out if it did at all play out in the history of the Communist Party in South Africa. Thank you very much. Look, I'm going to take part of those questions as comments because I think they're very interesting. Um, by the way, um, uh, Luxembourg as a theorist uh, uh, appears quite frequently initially uh, in the columns of uh, the party's newspaper. Um, and the party and the newspaper that preceded it before the party was formed by one of the forerunner organizations. She then sort of disappears subsequently, gets displaced by Lenin. Um, uh, the, the, the party, on the whole, though, didn't have much time for spontaneity, um, which I may be talking about rather vulgarly. It, it was very strong on the idea that you didn't do things before organization. Um, and it found it very difficult to cope when things suddenly happened in, diff in ways that it didn't understand always, um, we, 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 which it, it hadn't been able to predict. Um, for example, um, uh, the 
uprising in Soweto would perhaps be a case in point. Um, in the case of the party's understanding of the dynamic interaction between race and class, I, I think you would probably find their understanding um, uh, perhaps too basic. Um, they, uh, it, 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 broadly speaking, um, they made assumptions about uh, social location and consciousness, uh, which, 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 which were only sometimes historically proven to be true. Um, they were very slow uh, in acknowledging um, the um, incorporation as an auxiliary formation of the white working class in the 1920s. Um, and um, similarly speaking, uh, more recently, they, they tended to assume that post-apartheid South Africa would be a country in which a powerfully organized working class would predominate because the notion of a black bourgeoisie of any size, weight, or, or, or political substance um, was, 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 was extremely unlikely. I think there was another question next to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, just a short question. Um, by the way, I read, I just bought the book and read about the chapter. Uh, I finished reading the Apollo Davidson and um, Irina book. And, um, and in the first part that I've read of your book, I'm, I'm quite interested in the more really historical artisanship. Uh, in both books, um, you know, the, 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 the rigor with which uh, archival work has been done. Um, uh, and, and it's quite evident. Uh, um, I mean, I have issues with some of the directions that uh, Apollo and Irina's, especially their one dimensional view around Stalin and all of those, but, you know, but, but in terms of the actual methods, historical methods of doing, you know, historical research. Uh, it, it's really, really uh, very well done. And, and, and from the little that I've read of your book as well, I can, see, I, I, I can almost quite clearly see that. My question is um, around that scholarship in South Africa t today, you know, uh, how is that scholarship around training of uh, 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 really building and obviously, in this case, it should be uh, young black historians that are really skilled, that have a real artisan skills uh, of doing historical work. Um, I mean, to what in sense, uh, the field of political science and that uh, appendage they call uh, industrial relations, we know that has been completely almost destroyed. I mean, uh, uh, um, when I was still at the university, the trajectory of having to read proposals that came from that field was just almost like chewing rice and you bite a stone. Uh, 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 but my, my problem is that they had, I don't see much of real committed work of continuing to build those kind of skills, especially among young black uh, uh, postgrads, and, and so you were mentioning earlier that if there was a, a, a good biography to write, Moses Kotan, ideally that should have been a young, upcoming black historian. Mm -hmm. But where are those? Who's training them? Who's raising those? Thank look, look it's, it's, it, I mean, I, whether those points are, are fair is, is probably something that other people in this room can answer. Um, I'd be very reluctant to make comments about institutions with which I have, you know, been fairly disengaged. I mean, I, 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 I visit South Africa, I visit Vits, I keep up with friends and so forth. But I left South Africa in 2005. And broadly speaking, I think your comments would have certainly been more or less right in 2005. Uh, I've read work, though, by very engaging and well-trained and, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, in terms of artisanship workmen like black South African historians, and they are beginning to emerge in significant numbers, at least in better numbers than in the case of politics, um, where um, 
I, 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 I think uh, the kind of pioneering work, if you want to like think of a black South African political scientist, that was undertaken by Sam Nolashungu back in the 1980s uh, has, has never been matched by, 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 by anybody else um, who, who could be called a black South African. And I, I think, yes, I think these things matter, and I, I think it's tragic. Um, and, and I think we need to understand why and ask questions about it. But I, I can't really do more than just simply say that. Um, I, 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 I think that people in, in the academy are just as alert and anxious and worried about this as you are. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think I saw more hands. Um, can you raise them again? Are there any other questions? Um, there's a repeat. If there's new ones, we'll start with them. Um, one, and anyone else, and then we can take perhaps the second question, and then I have one more virtual question, which is if you could please elaborate on the role of Joe Slovo specifically during the exile period. Um, but I'll hand over to our first question at the back. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jacob Mamabolo. Um, <clears throat> I'm the provincial secretary of the SACP in Gauteng. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I don't really have a question, but I just want to, to comment to you, uh, Prof, for, for the good work of uh, putting together the history of the party and, of course, uh, what you believe is uh, its current or future prospects in our country. Um, I think we should, we should comment and thank you for that. <clears throat> but also, I was just impressed by the discussions that are taking place here. And I think if it were not for the book, definitely we may have not had the opportunity to hear some of the views about it, including whether members of the party are still communists. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and whether uh, the party is still relevant today. Um, maybe in thanking you, I must just uh, say that uh, the party throughout its entire history has grown from a constructive criticism and of course an assessment of itself. And therefore, we value comments and inputs that people make about the party. They help us uh, uh, to move on every day uh, in, the, in the struggle that we are waging. So we do take those comments, uh, whether we agree with them, but we do welcome a critique of the party. Uh, just the last point from me is that, uh, <clears throat> is that Sometimes, uh, I mean, I get told that at some different points in the history of the party, I don't know how true is this, but different generations have raised the same issue. Uh, there have been people who will say, in exile, in the underground, where is the party? Um, there have been times when for every problem, if it last breaks, it's because there are communists around. Um, and of course, different people have got uh, their own uh, you know, definition of what is a communist. And, and it's not new. So in that context, uh, I just want to say to you that in the party, uh, our assessment is that uh, we're celebrating 100 years. We have grown quantitatively, we have grown qualitatively. But uh, I guess we still have got a lot of work to do um, to really improve on the work that we are doing. And I guess that's a debate and discussion we will continue to have. But otherwise, thank you very much for an excellent work. And we will be much more better with your book. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I think there was a second question. Or that was a comment. We have a question. One more question, yeah. Here in front. Uh, thanks, Chess. Actually, not a new question. I'd, I would like to hear a bit from uh, Dr. Jagannath on some of the things that have been raised here. Selfishly, on my question on 
the point of history for whatever. So yeah. All right, great. Because I think what we would like to do, because unfortunately, as great as the discussion is, it has to come to an end soon. So I want to take a last pressing question, and then we can allow our panelists to respond to the last bunch, um, but also um, close us off. So if there's a last pressing question, then we can hand back over to the panel to take us home. Thanks again. Um, my question is, how did the Suppression of Communism Act have an impact on the trajectory intellectually and also um, uh, politi uh, politically or organizationally on the Communist Party. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll answer the questions that are directed to me briefly, and yeah. I think then you, could ha you should have the last word. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Comrade Jacob Mokoro, is that correct? Um, I, I didn't fully hear your name, but thank you for a generous and gentle comment. And um, I, I, I should say, by the way, that you know, at launches, often the sort of conventional launch, the author stands up and starts thanking people. Um, this is much more rigorous and refreshing. But um, in the work for the book, in the research for the book, uh, I got an enormous amount of help that was freely and generously given by veteran members of the party, existing members of the party, and so on. And there was never any effort to hold back, never any effort to control the kinds of questions that I was asking. Um, the, 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 the intellectual generosity that I encountered in the party is, I think, something that I should acknowledge. Uh, on Joe Slovo, um, there's a lot of detail about what Joe Slovo was doing uh, during the 60s, during the armed struggle. Um, he was one of the party's major strategic thinkers, uh, but that said, and I mean, um, Slova, I think, is one of the more interesting people uh, who you might call a party theorist in terms of the kind of work, that, uh, the, the writing that he was doing. But that said, Slovo was increasingly, until about 1987, drawn into the day-to-day -day exigencies from about 1976 through to 1987 of managing an armed struggle. And that didn't leave much time for theory or strategy or planning or looking forward into a dim and distant post-apartheid future. Because he was more concerned about you know, getting people across the Swazi frontier, setting up new infiltration routes when the party was kicked out of Mozambique, and so on. Uh, uh, you know, leading an armed struggle was very, very hard work. But many of the problems were practical issues. How you break down a rocket grenade launcher and carry it across the frontier so that the police don't find it. Uh, where do you pack it? In what kind of cars? That kind of thing. Um, those are the kinds of issues that people like Slova were often dealing with. Um, but he was, nevertheless, an absolutely critical person in, in the party's development and in its leadership uh, through the 60s and 70s and 80s and in the uh, projection and um, uh, evolution of the ANC's armed struggle as well, which is another story. It's only a story that I tell in the book in as much as it involves and engages the party. Uh, on the Suppression of Communism Act in 1950, um, the party, in fact, dissolved itself before being prohibited. Um, about a fifth of its membership was then contacted for the party's reconstruction, and the selection procedure was very much calculated uh, to include only the people who would be suitable for clandestine work and would exclude many of the people that made the 1940s Communist Party uh, such a vociferous, noisy, and quarrelsome place. Great. Um, Comrade Rashma. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think I was thinking about that question around the usefulness of the book and the way the book is important for us to read and why. For me, the main thing is, okay, you know, as a historian, I think anything is worthwhile to be read. But more importantly, what I found useful in the book is that in, in, in so much as it tells the story of the, of the South African Communist Party, it also provides us with a huge trove of material in which oftentimes Professor Lodge is not making a commentary upon in telling you how to think about it. So you can often draw your own conclusions. So in that way, it's really useful, a useful source for people to read. I mean, for example, one of the things that I was thinking about is in the last chapter, 
obviously the most contentious chapter, given the questions that were coming up, is they're actually communists in the Communist Party and so on. And yes, you know, believing you're a communist is nice, but they're not acting in a communist way and not practicing it and not pushing it out into society is another matter altogether. I mean, for example, in the last chapter, Professor Lodge talks about the way in which the Communist Party coming in the 1990s was different to other organized, other communists around the world, especially in Europe, that was in the decline. And the reason why they were seen to be a success is because they were attached to an organization that was in power and that they had that influence over that organization. But I think in many ways, in reading that story and reading that history and thinking through some of the questions that are coming from the floor around the relevancy of communism, around the relevancy of the party in particular, I think it's a broader problem of communist parties in this form. Not all forms of communism, but the particularly this version of the communist parties that exist everywhere in the world. The ways in which it is not rethinking according to the material conditions, how to embed itself within the struggles that are happening, not rethinking its role in society actively enough. And I think that has shown, that's shown for communism across the world. And myself, as a believer in communism, a communist myself, working in the trade union and the labor movement, I see that and I understand that that is a weakness and a criticism. And that's what's happened, like the fact that in the 80s and the 70s, they were not interested in the other iterations of communism in the United States, but only dealing with the party that was fairly irrelevant. Even today, if you try and make links with communist organizations across the world, us within the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, being outside the Communist Party, with many communists in the organization, practicing communism very well every day, we cannot enter those, 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 those terrains because it's not the formalized structures of these parties that have been in existence for over 100 years. So I think that's something our comrade in the back there, the chairperson, can think through maybe in your meetings as the Johannes Pauteng or Johannesburg group of the SACP is what is that? I mean, you know, it's not in the FISMAS 4 movement, it's not embedding itself in the universities, but it's also very importantly not embedding itself in the industrial proletariat, which would be a key, key constituency for it to organize it. And it has done so in the past. If you look at the early history of this book, you see that. You look at the ways in which it was thinking through how to organize within the labor movement, within the trade union, how to bring African workers in. And I think that's really important and that's illuminated very well in the, the early chapters of this book. So even just that history is important uh, for us. And I think that will lead me to my last point that was raised around the non-racialism. I think anti-racism should be a better term than non-racialism. And I think that, yes, the Communist Party might have not been articulating and theorizing overtly on that question, but there were lots of people within the party, and there's mention of them in this book, who are thinking about ways of indigenizing communism within South Africa. And that process started very early on. And that's not taken seriously by someone like Frank Wilderson, who is not considering that. And his critique is not necessarily to the Communist Party of South Africa, South African Communist Party. It's more against Marxism, a general critique of Marxism, which I think ignores the rich work that's been done by black Marxists across the world, from Claudia Jones, from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's later work, from Kwame Nkrumah, George Padmore, from Angela Davis, from uh, Walter Rodney. I mean, there's a huge collection of work, and many of that, much of that work is also embedded um, by black women who are communist and who are thinking through not just race and class, but gender as well, the intersection of those three things. And I think that critique from Wilderson uh, is fairly unfair on Marxists and communists in general. And it seeks to eradicate, I think, the class dimension from politics, which is incredibly dangerous because the question of class is fundamentally important to the race question and the gender question all over the world, but much more in South Africa. So I think for me that's the reason and I think that while there are some conclusions in the book that are mild criticisms, there's enough evidence for you to draw your own conclusions about and use it as a way to develop new work. So yes, that's why I think it's useful. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, we can hand back to Professor Lodge for a Closing few words before we end. <laughs>
really will be a few closing words and really just a thanks, both for the hospitality and generosity of the Forge in, in sponsoring and organizing a visit for me um, and in ir arranging a, a, a series of quite fascinating encounters which have been very enriching and which will ensure that the second edition of the book is even longer than the first. Um, and to all of you for the generosity and warmth that I'm encountering in your comments and the thoughtfulness of the, in the way, that the, uh, the thought that you've, and care that you've invested in, in reading my book. Thank all of you. Thank you very much. I think there's very little left for me to say, um, but I think I want to appreciate everyone who came out or who joined us virtually or who's going to go and view this discussion, a very important discussion at a later stage. I, I think many of us will have been drawn into this discussion for a range of reasons. We might be interested in history, we might be scholars, we might be interested in Tom Lodge because he's a great teacher and we know we'll learn something when, we're, when he's around, or we might be revolutionaries who want to change the world. Um, my hope is that we may be a little bit of everything, at least by the end of this discussion, because I think this book, and, and, and I want to insist that this is the case, maybe intentionally and maybe not, it's really two things. It's Yes, the history of the South African Communist Party, perhaps at least one of the most authoritative histories of that organization that at least I've ever come across. But it's also a history of communism, a history that's not yet done. So I think though it's named Red Road to Freedom, I think we should agree that perhaps it's Red Road towards freedom. Because the task that many of the people have taken on who are mentioned in this book, but who are also gathered in this room, who are joining us virtually, is a task that is yet to be completed. Because ultimately the, the communist state is the one where capitalism no longer exists. So I do think that we have all learned a lot. I think we should appreciate the forge, the team behind the scenes, the packers of the chairs and the washers of the dishes, but also appreciate everyone who has made a commitment, intellectual and otherwise, to the book, to the discussion and, and to the project that it is concerned with. So on that note, I want to wish everyone a very safe and happy evening and I hope that our conversations can continue as we continue buying the book, reading the book, engaging the book, um, and, and continuing with the discussions. Thank you very much to all, and have a good evening. Thank you.